I'm Adam Gopnik. I'm a writer, uh, often for the New Yorker magazine, uh, but also the author of, I think, nine books now. And I'm here to speak at Winter Words. I don't think there was ever a time, truly, when I didn't know I wanted to be a writer. You know, we're readers first and then become writers because we're readers. But if I had to locate it at a certain moment, it was when I was about seven years old, and I took out of my father's bookshelf the Thurber Carnival, a great anthology of the writings of James Thurber, a New Yorker humorist and storyteller, and it had an electric effect on me. I don't think I understood it. Sometimes the books that influence us most are not the books we understand the most deeply, but there was something about its tone of mixed urbane humor and melancholy that spoke to my condition in some deep way. The New Yorker in the 31 years that I've been resident there, and you know, without undue emotion, I think of myself as a citizen of the New Yorker as much as an employee of the New Yorker. In the 30 years I've been there, it's changed in some ways enormously. We've gone through uh, significant changes of editors. We've lived through the greatest, uh, I think, revolution of the past 50 years, the digital revolution. Now I write a piece at 9 a.m. without exaggeration, and it's online to our million plus readers at noon. In addition, we're competing now, not with The Atlantic or Saturday Review, but with the entire world of information and opinion. It's a totally different environment. At the same time, I think that the DNA of The New Yorker has remained remarkably stable and strong. When people ask, you know, what is that? What's the DNA? It's not very complicated. The New Yorker is a magazine of reporting and of humor. It's not a magazine primarily of opinion. We rest on, in plain English, on facts and jokes. And that's what we do best. And even when I'm writing something that's indignant or angry or profoundly concerned, as I've done a great deal in the last few years about politics or about gun violence, for instance, I try to make sure that it is humane in the first instance, that it sounds like a friend talking to a friend rather than like an editorial talking to an audience. And that's the core element of The New Yorker, that combination of informality and seriousness. The simple truth is when people ask me, you know, how do you uh, write about so many subjects, the answer can be summed up in two words. It's read books read books. I, that's what I do. I love to read books. And if you read books over a sufficient period of time, you find out about a lot of things and you get curious about a lot of things. And that's sort of the foundation of my illusion of omniscience is just that I like to read and I read a lot. What I always say and what I deeply believe is that we don't write about anything in life in order to change your mind. If I write about bringing up kids. It's not because I want you to have kids. It's not because I want someone else to have to deal with my experience. It's because we bear witness to the things that matter to us most in life. You know, life fires a storm of emotion at us every day and we have to try and organize it in some way. And that's what writers do. We organize the storm of emotion that the world creates and bear witness to our responses. We, we offer that to the world. When People ask me, what's the book I admire most or think is the, the most important? I always have a simple, very unimaginative answer. Uh, and it's an answer that speaks particularly to American experience right now. And that's Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Huck Finn. It's the most standard school book uh, classroom reading. But I think we never fully come to the end of its moral depths. My daughter, Olivia, just turned 17, read it this year and was astounded by it because what it teaches you is that you have to ignore the conventional opinion of the world around you. That's what Huck does. He's brought up in a slave state where people accept slavery and the, not just the oppression of black people, but the, uh, the ownership, the uh, condemnation to second-class humanity of black people. And through his own moral conscience, through his own instincts as a person, he uh, transcends and overcomes it. Overcomes bigotry and overcomes the limitations of his own very poor, completely uncultured, completely uneducated uh, upbringing. And that American fable of how um, our own instincts, our own uh, moral uh, uh, beliefs that would come from deep inside us can reform the world piece by piece is, I think, of incredible value to us. And the book is also the funniest book written in, in American literature. And that combination 
of humor and instinctive morality. I never go back to Huck Finn without feeling this is truly a great book and a great, a great teaching book that we all will never cease to learn from. One of the positive things I think that was part of my upbringing was it wasn't a very sharp divide between what mattered and what didn't matter. We were not a snobby family in that way. I'm sure we were horribly snobby in other ways. But there was a lot of hockey in our life and a lot of pop music in our life. The sounds of my childhood are not the sounds of Bach and Mozart, much though I learned to love them, but of the Beatles and the Stones. Uh, and so I grew up in an environment in which it was very easy to think that um, the world was available. And I think making the world available without too many distinctions or discriminations is part of what we want to do for the next generation. The musical theater has always been the great and secret passion of my life. There's nothing like the musical theater as a transmitter of emotion. If you think about it, everything else we do, books we write, essays we publish, novels we love, are all very sort of inert compared to the absolute liquid urgency of the musical theater. Think of all the shows you love from The Music Man to Hamilton, beyond that hits you, Camelot, with an emotional immediacy that no other art form can begin to equal. So to be taking part in that, uh, in that process is, is astounding and joyful. At the same time, it is the most difficult, by far the most difficult thing I've ever done. Uh, musical theater is famously contentious and famously hard because every element in it has to work. I will say, before anyone's had a chance to see it and before the critics have had a chance to kick it around and, uh, and hate me for being an interloper in somebody else's garden, that of all the things I've ever written, it's the one that means the most to me, this musical, The Most Beautiful Room in New York. And it speaks, I think, more from my heart than anything else I've ever written.